Hello, thank you everyone for joining this panel. Um, really excited to put it on. Um, this panel is about personal identity and diplomacy. And thank you to our very um, amazing panelists who are going to be on here. Um, I'll go ahead and start by introducing them. Uh, first, we have Ambassador Deborah Jones. Um, she has enjoyed a long career in diplomacy, serving as US Ambassador to Kuwait from 2008 to 2011 and as previously principal officer at the US Consulate General in Istanbul, Turkey, as well as several post posts throughout the Middle East and North Africa. She was appointed ambassador to Libya in March, 2013. She holds a BA in history from Brigham Young University and holds a master's in national security strategy from the National War College at National Defense University. And next we have Ambassador Ted Osius. Um, ambassador Ted Osius is president and CEO of US ASEAN Business Council. A diplomat for 30 years, Ambassador Osius served from 2014 to 17 as US ambassador to Vietnam. He is the author of Nothing is Impossible, America's Reconciliation with Vietnam, a for with a foreword by former Secretary of State John Kerry, covering the two countries' 25-year journey from adversaries to friends and partners. Ambassador Osius and his husband, Clayton Bond, have a son and a daughter. Next is Ambassador Charles Ray. Charles Ray retired from the US Foreign Service in 2012 after a 30 year career. Prior to joining the Foreign Service, he spent 20 years in the US Army retiring with the rank of major. During his 30 years in the Foreign Service, he has posted to China, Thailand, Sierra Leone, Vietnam, Cambodia, and Zimbabwe, and served as ambassador to Cambodia and Zimbabwe. Since his retirement from public service in 2012, he has been a full-time freelance writer, lecturer, consultant, and has done research on leadership and ethics. Next, we have Ambassador Marcel Waba. Ambassador Waba retired from the US Department of State in 2008, rank of Minister Counselor, after 22 years in the Foreign Service, spent mostly in the Middle East. She served as ambassador to the United Arab Emirates, and received the White House Presidential Meritorious Service Award for her service in the UAE. Waba also served as spokesperson and counselor in the US embassies in Nicosia, Amman, and Cairo. Her Washington assignments include serving in the Pentagon as Foreign Service Advisor to the Chief of Staff of the US Air Force and the Deputy at the National College of War at the National Defense University at Fort McNair. And our wonderful moderator, Ambassador Tibor Naj, um, Ambassador Naj, a retired career foreign service officer, spent 32 years in government service, including over 20 years in assignments across Africa. He served as U.S. Ambassador to Ethiopia and Guinea and Deputy Chief of Mission in Nigeria, Cameroon, and Togo. Previous assignments include Zambia and Seychelles, Ethiopia, and Washington, D.C. Ambassador Naj arrived in the United States in 1957 as a political refugee from Hungary. He received his BA from Texas Tech University and MSA from George Washington University. And with that, I'll go ahead and hand it over to Ambassador Naj. Thanks so much, uh, Kennedy, and welcome everybody to this uh, podcast on personal identity and diplomacy. First, a few words just about the American Academy of Diplomacy. Uh, the Academy is an independent nonprofit membership association of over 370 of America's most senior former diplomats and foreign policy leaders. Uh, it includes all former secretaries of state and the current secretary of state is also a member who's having to take a leave of absence. The Academy is dedicated to promoting professional diplomacy. And uh, one of the ways we do it is through outreach programs like this one. Think of the Academy kind of as the National Academy of Sciences for Diplomats. So with that brief introduction, I'm going to go right to our program. And what we're going to do, we have a number of questions and we have uh, members of our panel who will take the lead on the various questions. And then other panel members are welcome to chime in. And finally, at the end of the program, we will have some questions that have been submitted by the audience. So thank you very much. And I think you will hear some very frank uh, on, uh, answers and exchanges, uh, nothing with the party line, because uh, these folks are all <laughs> very, very accomplished. And uh, you will hear that the challenges they have faced through their careers were often uh, because of who they were, as opposed to uh, what they did. 
So we will start with um, number one, and this goes to Ambassador Jones. Ambassador Jones, what difficulties emerged in your personal life due to being given a posting that was not entirely welcoming to someone of your identity being in a position of power and influence? And were you supported by the State Department while serving in this post and experiencing these difficulties? Madam mm -hmm. Ambassador. Okay, thank you, Tyler. Thank you, Ambassador, and uh, pleasure to be here with everyone. You know, I've thought a lot about this issue, and I'm going to kind of put a flip on the question because um, I, in my experience, the the most of the opposition, as it were, such as it was, that I had encountered as I reached more senior levels in the service, actually came from within the institution not from the receiving countries, because I think many of the receiving countries think that we're quirky anyway. They, that, you know, we're powerful and we're quirky. So if the US decides to send a woman for the first time as the DCM, for example, in Abu Dhabi, well, that's the that's US. deputy what chief was, of mission. That's the people. deputy chief of mission, sorry. What were they thinking? Or the same thing when I went to Kuwait. So at the end of the day, they look at you kind of like, um, I think, uh, Samuel, uh, you know, the Samuel Johnson's dog that could walk on its hind feet. It's not, you know, they weren't sure you were doing it well, but the fact that you were doing it at all was a source of amazement for them. But when I was in the UAE, um, I through a series of uh, unexpected events, I was chargé for an extended period of time when I first arrived. That's the person who is between two ambassadors. The previous ambassador had gone and the new ambassador, the incoming ambassador had not yet arrived. So I was in charge of the mission. And it was during this time as we were already discussing with the Emiratis a lot of security cooperation that we had a high level mission coming and in preparation for that, we had the Secretary of Defense and some other senior people in the Defense Department coming. And the Crown Prince of the UAE, which it was at the time Khalifa, who's now the Sultan, the Emir, technically, but um, was hosting an event at the Officers Club. At uh, And I was the head of the American mission, technically, and so I planned completely to go. And I was surprised when two of my... Um, the two O six, the two colonels uh, who were at the mission in attache roles came to the office and expressed their great concern that it would really be highly inappropriate for me to go to the UAE Officers Club, which was a strictly male institution and organization. And I was somewhat taken aback and they said, no, ma'am, it would be extremely offensive. The Emiratis are not accustomed to this. This was 1998, by the way. And I, you know, went back to the department and said, are you concerned about this at all? I'm not concerned about this. So they said, no, you're the charge, you go. You you represent the United States. You're not representing Deborah Jones. And so I went and much to my relief and surprise, my pleasant surprise, um, Sheikh Khalifa actually made a point and he was quite of a shy guy anyway, as Ambassador Wahba knows, but he came over to me with his hand extended shook my hand, gave me a, with a twinkle in his eye and said to me in Arabic, see, this is one of the reasons you're glad you're not in Saudi Arabia. And it was very disarming for me, but also I think it was, you know, it made these other guys think twice. But again, um, and from then on, you know, we worked, we had a good working relationship, but I also want to say that it was very important for me to maintain a certain degree of decorum in that role as well. And I would be lying if I were not to say that, you know, I was a mother, I was married, I had children. For within that culture, I realized that that gave me a certain cachet, that as long as I stayed within those bounds, I was going to be fine. Um, and they were going to deal with me that way. I also had the added advantage of having Mormon ancestry, which the Arabs called the American Muslims. And so I would play that when I could because I actually have polygamy in my ancestry, um, you know, rules of health, laws of health, blah, blah. They all found it very intriguing. And so I made the most of that. Um, and that's usually how I dealt with those things. And, you know, I would check in, but I would play by the rules and hope that that got me through. And it usually did with a bit of humor as well. 
Thank you very, very much. Now, uh, colleagues, anybody else want to chime in on this one before we move on? Raise a hand or, or like that, or do the, the symbol up, up to you guys, however you want to do it. Anybody else want to want in on this one before we move on to, yeah, Charlie, I mean, Ambassador yeah. Ray. Yeah, I, I would, I would totally agree with one thing that Ambassador Jones said, and that is, you know, while, while our personal identities do sometimes get in the way of, of being able to do our jobs, in the 30 years that I was in the State Department and 20 in the Army, I found that more often than not, the impediments came from within the organizations, not from the foreign audiences we had to, to deal with. I, I, just uh, an, an example uh, from my, actually the start of my Foreign Service career when uh, during a, a and A100, I, I came out of the Army, I had spent most of my Army career in, in Asia. I was a Korean foreign area officer. I spoke two Asian languages and the State Department wanted to send me to Africa. And I said, no, thank you. I mean, not because I didn't eventually someday want to go, yeah. but I thought, you know, I'd one thing I always wanted to do was go to China and, and China was on the list. They actually tried to say, you probably would be more comfortable in <laughs> Africa. I mean, it's it's that kind of stuff that I am sure everyone on this panel at some point has had to deal with and it's us is as pogo said we have met the enemy and he is us thank you very much yes ambassador osius well just to echo what charlie said when when uh ambassador jones said the opposition comes from within i was like yes uh, because i that was my experience too and the other thing that i i feel like you really emphasized uh, Deborah, is that when you're yourself, that works best. Absolutely. Ambassador Wahba, any comment before we go on to your question? Sure. I um, Let me just uh, echo our one way, Deborah, one of the issues Deborah raised, which is uh, the question of oftentimes the, the stereotyping, which I think Ambassador Ray was being too diplomatic to say bluntly. Uh, by our colleagues at the State Department often gets in the way first. And in my case, that happened when I was appointed ambassador to the UAE. Um, a, lot of, a lot of chatter within the department because I was not the first choice of the, the bureau, but somehow I had managed to get the assignment. And the chatter was, well, she's a woman, she's Arab origin, she's Christian. Arab origin, and she's going to go to a Muslim a male dominated country. How is she going to survive? Um, but I also faced I, the on the other side as well. So I wanted to mention in contrast to this, when I served in uh, Egypt, which is my country of origin, um, I actually got the backlash the other way. Um, a, a lot of Egyptians, especially uh, the elite, the older elite, uh, the senior people in the media world and in the foreign policy world in Egypt looked at me with great suspicion because as somebody uh, mentioned earlier on when we, before we went online, uh, there was the issue of, is she really an American? Yeah. Is she, you know, she's not quite American enough to be a diplomat representing the United States to Egypt. So I really had a difficult time actually overcoming that and gaining their trust and being able to function as a diplomat that could be respected and at the same time acknowledge the fact that my origins actually helped me to uh, bridge the gap, the huge divide between our cultures and our countries. Thank you very much. Ambassador Wamba, staying with you, and this is a, a spin on, on the question that Ambassador Jones got. On, on the above question, how did the public's reception different, differ from the government's official reception, if it did? And how did that difference impact your work, both working on the ground and in the office? Well, I think it's very hard. I, I thought about this question when I got your email, and it's really hard to divorce the two uh, because we we once you're assigned overseas, we move in circles that are a mixture of private and government. So um, certainly the government relationships are very important for you to conduct your business. But I would argue that without the very um, close interpersonal 
and effective relationships that you can develop outside of the official circles, it really makes a huge difference in how successful you are within the official circles. I'll give you an example. When I was about to, uh, I was in the UAE right after 9-11, literally uh, for six weeks after 9-11. So it was a difficult time for the United States to gain trust. And we were heavy handed with a lot of things for good reason. Uh, we'd just been dealt quite a blow. Um, but by the time I left the UAE, I remember one of the senior officials uh, in my farewell call, she looked at me and she said, you know what you've done differently that really helped during this time is that your outreach to throughout the UAE on a personal level allowed our people to like you as an ambassador and that helped us work with you officially as an ambassador. And that's when it clicked in my head really that somebody from, the, from that side of the aisle had managed to put it in words why it's so important to mix those two, the, the, the personal and the official. Thank you very much. Colleagues, does anybody else want to weigh in on that one? Deborah? Did I yeah, sure. You know, it's interesting because um, I agree completely with uh, Marcel on the importance of getting out. And I, you know, I do think we there is that balance we always have to maintain. We are the president's representative. We're not just ourselves. However, that contact within these societies not only um, gives them a different perspective on the ambassador, who is kind of a mysterious persona to many people or a, an all powerful. And, and it's nice for people to get to know you as a human being as well. But I also I have to say that when I was in Kuwait, I ran into a kind of almost the different um, problem where the Kuwaitis, I think, had been so um, they're quite a conservative uh, in many respects society. But the, and the leadership has been pretty compartmentalized. I mean, it's a, it's an interesting place that way. They're kind of a and I and I'm not saying anything here. I haven't said to them. I they're kind of a petty bourgeois kingdom, and you know they they have a very comfortable lifestyle and they like it that way, and they don't like a lot of interference in their business. And even the U.S. military, you know, at following the liberation, uh, we actually own. Camp Arif John, we own a large base in in Kuwait that was given to us by the previous emir, but two previous emirs now uh, over. But still, they have kept their inner sanctum pretty closed. You know, you get to know them, but they've been pretty closed, and they still had very much the male diwania and the other thing. And I started going around quite a bit because I was the first U.S. female ambassador to Kuwait, and I would actually go and I wanted to meet the young people as well. And I would go to some of the hamburger places and I would go with my daughters or I would go to places and meet these young people and meet regular Kuwaitis in the shopping malls and stuff. And I actually found it got to a point where if you got to know very well people who were close to the leadership in different ways, some of them were fine with that. Some of them were very uncomfortable with that. And it started making them wonder, you know, if you were getting to know too much about them because they kind of like their little kingdom without people meddling in it. And so um, I actually found that there was a little bit of blowback. The Kuwaitis themselves really liked me. Um, I think the, the Emir and I got along very well, but there were people in circles around that started whispering that, you know, we're not, we're a little bit concerned about what was I really up to? Was I trying to find family secrets as it were in a society that's quite private? in that sense. And I and I do know of you know ambassadors and other posts who've had a similar experience where they were quite popular getting out and about with the locals or whomever with the regular you know nationals um and the leadership had a, an adver adverse reaction to that. So it's something to keep an eye on. It's a balancing act. Absolutely good point. Anybody else before we move on to ambassador Osius? Yes, Charlie. I was going to say, and it's not just countries that have religious differences. When I was in Zimbabwe, and this was during the time when Secretary Clinton's uh, focus was on outreach to young people, uh, and I, I visited every province and every corner of the country, actually got along with Mugabe, but the people around him were, were had puppies when, when I would hold meetings with young people and get a larger crowd than the youth minister. It got so bad that 
they started actually closing venues when I would schedule meetings to keep people from coming. We act we had to start having live Facebook meetings with young people uh, because the government felt that I was. In fact, the, the youth minister at one point publicly at a reception uh, came up and asked me if I was trying to take his job. Hey, Charlie, there's a election soon in Zimbabwe. You want to register as a candidate? Please don't 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 say that out loud because I'm sure there are some people there who would do it. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Okay, uh, moving on to Ambassador Osius. Ambassador, did public reception have an impact on your personal life outside of work and the embassy, or on how you interacted with members of the public? Uh, thank you. Uh, Charlie mentioned Facebook, and that made me think we, at one point, I, I suppose uh, I had about a, a million Facebook followers. We used social media a lot when I was ambassador to Vietnam. And um, the good thing about one of the good things about social media is you can sometimes reach over the government and get messages out to the people um, without going through official channels. But it's also good for what you hear back. Uh, you can you can measure how well your communication is playing. Well, we were the uh, the first out gay couple to show up in the senior position in Vietnam, which is a pretty conservative society. And so uh, sometimes we would get homophobic remarks on on the Facebook page. Um, you know, they were ugly sometimes, um, but I didn't tend to react, and I didn't need to because. If someone wrote wrote something homophobic, then the other the fans were, who were quite loyal would you know chime in and say, "We love our gay ambassador." You know, they they just sort of they'd slam the uh, the the people who would would uh, write homophobic comments on Facebook. Um, we we had decided right from the beginning um, we were going to be who we are, and so when we'd done that initial. Uh, video where you introduce yourself to the public. That's now, uh, I think, pretty standard practice, but it was fairly new at the time. Um, we made sure that, you know, it was my husband and myself and our kids, so that the first images that the Vietnamese people had of us were our whole family. And then we made sure that the first image after we got off, off the plane uh, landing in Hanoi was of our three generational family, but it was two dads and to fortunately very photogenic kids. Um, we, we didn't want equality to be a foreign thing. It wasn't, we didn't want it to be a kind of the US agenda, anything that we were imposing on Vietnamese society. It's for the Vietnamese to decide what their society is going to be like, but it's really, a photograph is really powerful. And so very often we would just show up and, you know, did I mention the kids are photogenic? Whenever we showed up with the kids, it it was it was uh, it was a big hit. Uh, so um, I, I found that you know being ourselves was actually really advantageous um, because we had we the government knew we had a following. They knew that people were interested in us as a family, uh, and also they knew I was able to communicate um, beyond the government uh, when. When necessary, this I think this was the same lesson that we learned in Indonesia when we were ourselves in a Muslim majority nation. We got invitations everywhere. We're we're a black and white couple, two men, and um, we were very visible. And I, again, I thought the the photographs were helpful. In India, also a conservative society, we found it useful just to show up as who we are. And I think it was beneficial to the United States when we did so. Uh, the only place where we really had a problem was, um, and I'd left the Foreign Service by then, was Singapore. Very modern Singapore. You wouldn't think of, of it as the most conservative place, but that's where it was roughest. They wouldn't give a visa to my spouse uh, as a member of the family. Uh, it, it was challenging. But in all of these other conservative societies, we were embraced, and I think that sort of goes to show what what uh, Deborah said is correct. When 
you know, very often there's more opposition from inside than from the societies where we interact. Thank you very much. Any other colleagues want to add anything to what uh, Ted said? <clears throat> You know, the Never. only thing the only thing I would add to I think what we've all been saying too though is is the respect also, you know, being who we are and showing interest and respect in their societies as well. And I think that's the real key is that if you have a genuine, you show a genuine desire to understand that society, to connect, to hear them out, even if they want to comment on or ask you a question about you know, who you are or your background or why you're here. In my case, it was often, well, why, you know, why is your husband serving here and you're here? Why are, you know, um, but I think everything can be dealt with if you're, if you have a genuine interest in who they are as well and understanding. And by the way, you know, I would, ex we often have to explain again ourselves with our own rules, which we're not very conscious of, you know, when when the Kuwaitis kind of push back on when we had the first married couple, I think that came from state, you know, and we were trying to get the the paperwork done there. But, you know, Pat Kennedy and I had a conversation. I said, Pat, you know, in these cultures, an unmarried single child is a member of family until they marry, but we won't give them visas either. So we need to find, you know, because we say in the United States, when you're 21, that's it, you're out of the family. And I said, so we need to also be thinking about how we accommodate um, others as well, because we all have our own sets of petty rules. <laughs> Thank you. Any other comments on this before we move on to Ambassador Ray? Anybody? Okay. Ambassador Ray, how did you go about accomplishing your mission despite the challenges you faced in regards to your personal life? Well, when I joined the Foreign Service in 1982, I, I actually came in with, with two sets of baggage that, that were complicated. Uh, one was, of course, African-American, uh, but the second, and, and believe it or not, the most troublesome for a good part of my career was that I, I came in uh, from as a career military person. And so, I found myself, and and the, and again, going back to what we've all said, the problems were seldom the countries where I was assigned, but were in, within the department of its, itself and people. And and just to give you an example, um, it's both positive and negative. I I, I would run into I, there were two kinds of people that I dealt with in thirty years in the foreign service. There were those who, especially back in the early eighties who felt that if you were military, you were some kind of dumb knuckle dragger who, yeah. who you know, liked to break things. And, and, and they were sometimes not comfortable in my presence. And, and that's, you know, that, that, can, that can be a little bit grating. But the other, which is also grating, is the people who, oh, he was in the military. He can do anything. I mean, you know, these guys are supermen. You got a problem that no one else will handle. Give it to Charlie. He'll do it. Uh, and that's meant to be positive, but it really just, ugh, it makes my teeth itch when people do that. Uh, but, you know, and the, the way I overcame it, I spent 20 years in the military learning to accomplish whatever mission I was assigned. And, and to put that in perspective, I joined the Army in 1962 from a little town in Texas I was, when I went through basic training, my basic training unit of about a hundred plus people had, I think, five African-Americans. I mean, I had a bunch of Southern boys. Um, I had scored highest on all of the, you know, the tests they give you. And, and of course, the, 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 our drill sergeants and the company commander were always using me to beat up the slower guys. You can imagine how, how I had to learn to navigate in the barracks at night when I didn't have the drill sergeant there to defend me. I learned, I, I learned to defend myself very early, uh, being the example of what a soldier is supposed to be. Uh, so what I learned to do was, was not let these little things get to me and not let them get in the way of getting the job done, and and I think as I look back on it, one of the one of the big biggest things in in my foreign service career was that I often 
volunteered for jobs that I would have to go home and find a, you know, a book or a regulation and read up on because I'd never heard of before. But I was always taught that if you want to get ahead, you got to step out ahead of other people. I, I, I remember my first assignment in Guangzhou. Uh, the department was just beginning to install the Wang computers. Uh, yes. you, know, you, you didn't even have you didn't even have fax machines in embassies. Well, they shipped a they shipped several cartons of Wang computers to Guangzhou, where I was stationed, and they arrived. And our admin guy put them in the warehouse and everybody sat around and said, what the hell are we supposed to do with these things? Because they didn't send anyone to, uh, to, to install them. And I volunteered. I, I had worked computers and I actually worked on a project of, of computerized artillery fire direction when I was in the Army. So I volunteered to do it. I had never seen a Wang computer. The, the Army didn't have them. Uh, we had, a, we had another, another company's computers. And, and since no one else knew, they said, what the hell? You know, they gave it to me. And I would take the instruction books back to my, we, we lived and worked in a hotel in Guangzhou. I would take the instruction books at night to my hotel room. And after feeding the kids and putting them to bed, I would sit until midnight reading. And then I would go in the next morning and what I read, I would do. And, and that's how I became a computer expert because I was the only guy that read the books. Uh, and, and that's how I got around it is that I, I, you know, I basically figure out what the job was, get the job done and move on. And when, you know, if people wanted to make comments, uh, sometimes I would have to grit my teeth. Uh, and my dentist tells me that, that there are signs of it. I would ignore it and just, just move on. The, the interesting thing was, I rarely, rarely got this kind of reaction from locals. I mean, this was, this was all in-house. Uh, I was in China in 1983, from 1983 until about 1987, because I did two back-to-back -to -back tours. And I traveled all over China. I actually got to go some places that American diplomats didn't go if, as long as I was by myself because the Chinese were not accustomed to African-American diplomats. And so a lot of times I could walk into places and they would assume I was some third world student there and ignore me until they asked for ID. So, I mean, it, it's, it basically, I got through it by focusing on what I was there for and, and doing that and, and not sweating the small stuff. Super. Thanks so, so much, Charlie. Uh, any of the, yes, Ted. Well, since we've all said the enemy is within, uh, I guess that leads me to kind of the next step, which is uh, Gina Abercrombie Winstanley cannot do what she's trying to do alone. I, I think the State Department has uh, a Secretary of State who is genuinely committed to uh, diversity, who truly believes in diversity, and that was why he he asked her to lead this effort, but she, she can't do it without support at all levels uh, in, order, in order to make the State Department a, a more equal place requires everybody, not just chiefs of mission, not just very senior people, but uh, uh, up and down the ranks. Thank you. Uh, Marcel or Deborah, anything you guys want to chime in on on this? Yeah, I do. Th I think that, um, you know, I related so much of what Charlie was saying about just getting the job done many times, how important that is to, you know, dis disregarding the noise and getting the job done, because at the end of the day, that's what it's about. And we're there to fulfill, you know, a mission. But I always, I always go back and I've often told this anecdote to younger officers or other colleagues that when I was in um, Baghdad on my second tour, my second assignment, I was assigned as a general services officer, which you know, was dealing in a in wartime Iraq with Iran-Iraq war going on. And it was hard. It was really hard getting things in. Things were stolen all the time. Um, it was my two predecessors had both curtailed. They just couldn't deal with it. They were both males, by the way. I just want to say. But and then later on, um, David Newton, God rest his soul, David was the our ambassador at the time. My mother actually came out to visit Iraq in 1986, I guess it was. 
And Gina, by the way, was at post with us, Ted. Also, she was uh, she, that was her first tour in the in the Foreign Service. She arrived in 1985. But um, and my mother came home. Uh, the ambassador hosted a dinner in honor of my mother. Actually, she was very charming. And um, when we came home, she told me something that really that both pleased and upset me a lot. She said that the ambassador had said to her, you know, when Deborah first arrived at post, we didn't think she was going to make it. But your daughter is going to be an ambassador one day. And instead of focusing on the your daughter is going to be an ambassador one day, I was crestfallen. And I said, Mom, why did everyone think I was not going to make it? because I was a girl, because I was too cheery, because I was blonde, because I was short, whatever the thing is. I said, what was that? She said, oh, for heaven's sake. You know, she was kind of disappointed. But for me, it was, and, and I think the greatest, if I had one message, Ted, to go back on the diversity and acceptance of others, it's check your own reaction to somebody. When you first look at them, or you hear a name that's exotic, or you see that they are in a gay marriage, or whatever it is, and they, for the first time you look at them, do you have an expectation of success and decide that you're going to do everything possible to help them out to succeed? And even when they stumble, which we all do, you're going to get them over that stumble and, and guide them to that success? Or do you have an you know, an expectation of failure. And so they can do 95% of everything perfectly well. And they do the one thing less than perfectly well. And you say inside, ah, I knew they were going to screw up. Why did you know they were going to screw up? You didn't know they were going to screw up. You helped them. You know, it's like with children, when you're raising your children, you're the, you know, the, the bicycle goes in the direction in which the child is looking. And if you're directing them to the problems if you're telling your child, don't put your finger in the socket, that's exactly where they're going to be drawn and distracted from what you want them to do. So that's my biggest, you know, I, I you know, and I, and I remind myself of this all the time, have an expectation of success and support it instead of an expect of a hidden expectation of, I'm just waiting for you to screw up. Thanks so much for making that point. And I hope that the students watching make a special note of that and apply that in their, their own lives going forward. No, thank you very much. Yes, Marcel. I'll just add that um, for, especially for the, um, uh, the young people out there who are considering a, uh, a career in the foreign service, I think it's also important for us to mention the fact that in addition to the diversity issues, whether on racial or um, gender or lifestyle, there's also a lot of built-in cultural issues at the State Department. And I would, I, it came to mind when Ambassador Ray mentioned that he came from the military and some of the, the um, stereotyping that he faced as an officer within the State Department. And I think it's, it's, it would be important for people to recognize that the department needs to work on changing its own culture. And that can only happen with the young people who are coming into the Foreign Service. But I, I mean, I came in as a uh, Foreign Service officer through USIA. So I was a public diplomacy officer. And I, obviously when the merger happened between USIA and state, I have to tell you that I saw a lot of cultural issues that I had never faced at USIA, that I faced at the State Department. Uh, whether you, you know, the hierarchy of being a political officer was, you know, the end thing. If econ was just one step below that, GSOs and admin were number three. And then when PD came in, we were number maybe four. Um, and that built-in cultural bias really upset me. I came from an organization where it was a lot more. Uh, I mean, nothing is ever perfect. Even USIA was not perfect, but we really had a much, <laughs> much more equilibrium in terms of how we saw each other. So whether you were doing press or culture or running the organization, running those big budgets that we had, um, there was kind of a mutual recognition that we needed one another to survive. In the State Department, the competition can be very cutthroat and very nasty yeah. and not at all supportive. So um, I mentioned this for uh, incoming officers because it's very important to navigate that and not to become part of this problem. 
because it's self-perpetuating and we would have to make an extraordinary effort to be more democratic in our culture within the State Department. And I think that's one thing that I, I always like to mention to people who are thinking about the Foreign Service because they come in really unaware of this, you know, and if you don't serve enough in Washington and you're always overseas while well, you're kind of that person who likes being overseas and the policy wonks are the ones who end up being ambassador. Well, it's not always that. I served overseas almost 20 years and hardly didn't have a single assignment in the State Department until I came back from the UAE. So there are exceptions to those rules, but those are rules that people often um, you know, perpetuate and it, they're not positive experiences. Totally with you, Marcel. I spent my entire career overseas except half of an assignment. So <clears throat> now we've started um, this, this next section but I want to go ahead and continue it because I think this is very important and relevant to our audience. Tips and tricks that helped you, and this is about imparting wisdom for future, future generations of diplomats. So who would like to start? Ted, we'll go to you first. And we've touched on it already, but um, I've met a lot of young audiences when I was in Vietnam. And often people whose parents said, you know, this is what you should do, or this is what you do, you should do. I, my only advice was be yourself, because you're going to be better at it than trying to be somebody else. You'll be a better leader if you are yourself, your, your true self, if you bring your true self to work, than if you try to fake it and be, be something else. And then maybe the second thing is something that Deborah referred to earlier. When you show respect to culture, when you show respect to a language, uh, you know, to the religion, the cultural traditions of the place where you work, it's going to be paid back in spades. Um, that's the that is the key to to winning over uh, those whom we want to be our friends is that that show of respect because the United States casts a long shadow, and when we, especially as official Americans, show respect in the countries where we serve, boy, that makes a big difference. Absolutely, Charlie. I would. Well, I, sorry. I, go ahead. I agree, Charlie. Thank you. I, I agree with 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 that. In fact, Ted sort of stole part of my thunder. But but the other issue I would tell young people coming into to uh, to this profession, uh, one is there are no unimportant jobs. I mean, and there are no unimportant people. Every individual in the organization is important. Uh, to that organization now, you know the our our culture the, that whole the the Brahmins, the political types. I mean, we have that. But you know, I reminded when I was an ambassador, when I was a consul general, I reminded people, you know, if the janitors don't come to work, if the mechanics go on strike, try to get your job done. I dare you. I mean, it, it's the the one thing I learned in the military is that the worst person you can offend is the private working in the mess hall because he's fixing your food. So, you know, there is that. The other uh, is in, in addition to, to being yourself is remember that you are, I mean, you are you, but you are part of an organization and, and the, the, your success is that organization success or vice versa? And, and if you, you're spending your time trying to undercut other people to build yourself up, what you're doing is you're destroying the organization and in the end you destroy yourself. And so it, it's, it's like everyone, it's a team and, and everyone on the team has a role to play and, and they need to support each other to do it. Uh, and I, I the students that I had, I did a, a workshop in the Pickering program at Howard for eight years until last year. And, and even though I was teaching one thing, I always spent a lot of time telling those kids is that if you do decide to do a foreign service career or whatever else you do, don't ever forget that, you know, you are the most important person in that organization until the day you start thinking of yourself as the most important person in that organization. And that's the day you're going to screw up. Thank you, Charlie. Marcel. I was just going to add that in, you know, obviously be yourself, be yourself, but also remember the foreign service is actually a very small group of people. 
and from the minute you join and you're a junior officer to the day you retire, you're part of a small culture. And so networking and supporting one another really is the only way to succeed in the foreign service uh, because the reputation is everything in the end. If you come across as uh, being um, destructive either to your colleagues or to the organization, it follows you and you can never overcome that. The only other thing I would add is that a lot of people uh, join the foreign service not realizing that it means you travel and you leave countries every three years and you make new friends and new family friends every three years. So if, if just make sure you're, you, you like to do that because a lot of people join the foreign service and then kind of live in a, in a bubble uh, within the department not, or within their uh, embassy and not get out into the culture because it's just too alien and wait for the day that they can come home. And if that's, if that's your, um, you know, the academy has a very uh, passionate uh, mission to make sure that State Department Foreign Service officers, when they get to those countries, they get out and about. And I couldn't agree more. If you don't, you'll never get to know the country. One last uh, message about getting ahead, learn the languages. If you don't learn the language, there's no way you're going to ever learn the culture. Or as Deborah said earlier, um, people will not see you as respecting or interested in, the, in who they are and how their country functions. If you don't have the language, it's a non-starter. Uh, could I add so, one thing too? Of course. And I totally to agree. Deborah. Learn the language and learn the food. <laughs> that one's I, I easy. Mean, that one's easy. You, <laughs> oh yeah, but I mean, if you if you yeah. can, you know, people who break bread together don't yeah. often go to war with each other. That's true. Absolutely, Troy, Deborah, and then I think Ted, you had something too. Okay, so I was going to tag on one thing. I was going to say, uh, Ambassador Ray is really right. Uh, you know, you thank people, thank people in your mission. Thank everybody, because you can write the most brilliant message in the world. And if you don't have someone sending that on to Washington, it's worth nothing. You know, it's just air. That's one thing. Number two, though, do your homework. And this gets into the learning the language, too. But learn about the country. Learn about whatever your subject matter is. You really are there to develop a degree of expertise. It's work. It's not just osmosis. You know, some of it, you know, getting out in the culture, we've been talking about that part of it. But you really have an obligation to learn your job and to do your job. And my and, and that kind of tags on to my third thing here, which is be reliable. You know, it, it is so important that you be reliable, that when you say you're going to do something, whether it's putting together that computer system, you know, or whatever it is that you say you're going to do, take care of, do it. Try, work on it and get it done because that's what people really look to your leadership and your colleagues look to having someone who's reliable you look for that in your friends as well the one and i would add one final thing and then i'll be quiet the the uh, well no i won't but i will be try to be <laughs> is that you know back to again what we were talking about in in terms of um the organization and respect for and and what marcel was also saying about these things don't when you bad mouth your organization, or when you when you think, never think that it makes you look better to suggest to the host country that you're working for a bunch of idiots or for a government that doesn't know what it's doing. Because nobody wants to deal with somebody who works for a, a bad organization. You know, if you're bad mouthing your country, no one's going to listen to you anymore or think much of what you have to say. So you're allowed to have those doubts, those concerns, and you know, that's why we speak to each other in a skiff or in a in a private channel. You're certainly allowed to express doubts about a policy within house, but it is important. It is important work and it is important to um, to maintain a certain um, dignity, as it were, you know, with the host government as well, so that because they are not going to respect you. If you think that by, you're going to make a special friend or get added information by saying, by the way, we're kind of don't do it. You might be tempted. Don't do it. Another great point for, for people to put down. Ted, did you want to ask something or? Oh, no, it was, it was really to emphasize what Marcella said about learning the language. I, you know, I thought when we went overseas, I might be pigeonholed as the gay ambassador, or I might be the Viking ambassador or whatever it was. 
No, I was the ambassador who spoke Vietnamese. And everywhere we went, people knew before I got there, oh, he's the American ambassador who speaks Vietnamese. It's, and it goes back to that respect and the showing respect to the culture and the traditions of where you serve. Thank you very much. And now I think we can go ahead to some of the questions that we got from uh, the audience. And the first one, Ted, I'm going to direct to you. This goes to the LGBTQ issue. And, and, and again, this I think is symptomatic that institutions invariably are behind uh, advances in society. And State Department has been very true on that on, <laughs> across the board and often still trying to catch up. So how does the State Department support LGBTQ staff and spouses when working in states which do not recognize LGBTQ marriages and or have discriminatory laws against this community? How might I represent the fullness of my identity in such postings without compromising personal safety and the safety of my family? Uh, first of all, institutions are behind and the, you know, the State Department got very frightened back in during the era, era of Joe McCarthy about communists and gay people. And that it actually took, it's taken decades and decades and decades for that attitude to shift. Um, the creation of GLIFA, Gays and Lesbians and Foreign Affairs Agency, uh, took place during the George H.W. Bush administration. But gay people, there was no policy to to, uh, about equality for gay people until Clinton's second term. That was the first time there was a, a, a policy that said we will not discriminate against LGBTQ plus people. So the, the system now is a little bit uh, bifurcated. It's a little it, it's it's a little bit random, and you have in some countries chiefs of mission who are extremely supportive of their LGBTQ employees. And then you have in other countries, chiefs of mission who are not. And that's, unfortunately, that still reigns. The, I think the, the department is trying to make it more consistent and more fair, um, but there's still a lot is, is placed on the chief of mission to determine how to deal with her or his uh, LGBTQ plus officers. Uh, Glyfa, what, which I mentioned, is the affinity group. And one of the things that they do is they conduct a regular survey and now they have support from management to do so about how gay people are treated in each country so that they can give bidders uh, uh, you know, an idea, uh, is your spouse going to be able to get a visa? Is you, are, you, are you gonna be able to get medevac, uh, medevac support? Uh, if your spouse gets sick or your your child, I mean, is your how is your family going to be treated? That's the basic question that people have. And now we have, I think, now the department uh, working with Glyfa has a lot better resources for identifying what it's going to be like in key countries. In the end, officers are are often faced with a really tough choice. You know, do I go a place where I really want to go, but I'm not sure how we're going to be treated? And that's an individual uh, that's an individual process. Thank you very, very much. Um, another question, and this I'll throw out to, to my colleagues. <clears throat> how does your government role play into how you use social media? Are you free to express your personal identities on social media? And do you see it more as a ground for engagement or a minefield where you need to watch your step and follow the marked path? I'm sure no one out there has ever gotten in trouble for using social media. Charlie. <laughs> Well, I mean, I started using social media before the department actually discovered social media. Uh, and and when I went to Zimbabwe, the, the department was was in the process of trying to develop a social media policy. They, on the one hand, they were sort of encouraging people, but on the other, in many a lot of the bureaus put so many clearance requirements in that, that many posts just just didn't bother. Uh, and, and we we got into, uh, I guess you would say, social media activism in Zimbabwe um, 
the circumstances forced it. As I said, the, the government started started in interfering with physical meetings. And so we wound up having to use social media, uh, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and, and texting to actually communicate with a lot of the non-government audiences. And in some cases, even, even some people in government who, who weren't quite buying into the hardline uh, playbook, but couldn't express it in public. Uh, I, I communicated with some government ministers via playbook, uh, I mean, with, via Facebook, uh, because the government was too klutzy to monitor it. And it was the only place that it was safe uh, for them to actually get, they couldn't come to the embassy. Uh, I couldn't go to their offices. Uh, and the only way we could communicate was for, for several months after I arrived was through, was through social media. Um, and so in a sense, I, I probably had more leeway, well, and also Zimbabwe was not exactly a high priority back in Washington. And, and so people weren't paying a lot of attention and I was able to, to be myself. At the same time, I recognized that, that whatever, whatever I did, whether it was go to a restaurant for lunch, make a social media posting or, or whatever, I was still seen as the U.S. government representative, so I was always, I, I probably said and did things that there were some of the traditionalists in the department who, who cringed, but never anything that violated any rules, never anything that undercut uh, our mission or, or, you know, undercut U.S. policy. Uh, I always made it a point, in fact, one of the issues going back to this whole personal situation and how it affects you. My two tours in Africa, first in Sierra Leone back in the 90s and then in Zimbabwe, uh, there, was a, there was an expectation, I think, on the part of a lot of the government people initially that because I was African-American, I would be more sympathetic to them. And it came as something of a shock in both countries uh, when in the first conversation and that came up, I reminded them that I was an American government official and that my first loyalty was to my government, not to theirs. And it took a while of working with people to actually get that message in. So in a way I did freelance in that there wasn't a lot of... Looks like Charlie froze. Like froze. Yeah. Yeah. Charlie, sorry, you're frozen. I'm yes. Maryland's Maryland's internet speeds are very slow. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry about. It. Okay, well, we're coming to the very, very end. So, Deborah, I know you wanted to add something, so I think you're yeah. going to get the last word. Okay, well, I'll try to go quickly. I, you know, on social media, I had a unique experience. I think when I arrived in Libya in June of 2013, this was following the Benghazi uh, tragedy, and so we were restricted to a certain area of, you know, of Tripoli and environs and maybe, you know, as far as Misrata, but not further east. And so the way we decided to reach out was using Twitter. And what I've learned, I learned two things very quickly. One, I learned that the ambassador had to absolutely control the ambassador's Twitter account, that junior, more junior officers would be inclined to make comments that, you know, and it took two of these episodes and I had to say, you guys do not speak on my behalf on my Twitter account. And so cut that one off and limited it, it more. But the other danger that you fall into when you have a highly, um, you know, a very fraught political situation within, and in fact, before, you know, going into civil war again, was that, um, uh, there were bots. There are a lot of very nasty people on Twitter and they will come after you. And it, and I think, you know, I'm not sure about the virtues. I had at one point about a quarter of a million followers in Libya because they were very media savvy and literate despite all their other problems out of a population of 6 million. But I'm not sure how many of those were even real. And it got rather heated and it distracted. And I do think that our young people have to re remember you're only in that country by virtue of being assigned by the United States. And you have to remember that, you know, the ambassador is in a little bit of a different 
position per se, but but for everyone else, you know, to express your full identity, you know, do that at home, do that on a on a non-official account, um, do that without affiliation with the embassy. But you know, when you're working, when you're in a place only because you work for the US government, you need to bear that in mind. I think I'm conservative that way. Words of wisdom, thank you very, very much. And distinguished colleagues, thank you so much for giving of your very valuable time for this program. And Kennedy, thank you. Yes, Kennedy. Th thanks to the Academy, well done. And uh, congrats, say, uh, say hi to all my friends out there at Texas Tech Kennedy. Over <laughs> to you. Me. Yes, sir, I'll definitely do that. Um, thank you to everyone for attending and thank you to our wonderful panelists for even joining this panel. Um, I hope everyone had a wonderful time. I definitely did. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Farewell, goodbye. And again, thank you. everybody. Great to see everybody, thank you. Yeah, nice to see you all too, bye-bye. Bye-bye.